The opinions expressed in this show are the views of the host and not necessarily that of WTRW, 94.3 The Talker, or the Bold Gold Media Group. The following presentation is brought to you by the host of the program who is solely responsible for its content. Good afternoon. Welcome to Make a Change. I'm your host, Terry Martin, along with my producer, Tom Jenkins. Good afternoon, Terry. Good afternoon to you. Tom, today we have Mark Volk, president of Lackawanna College. He's our very special guest, and he's here to tell us all about who he is and what he's accomplished in his life. Well, a little bit that I've known, because <laughs> I work with uh, David Madeira. Uh, I also work with Shale Gas News. And when it comes to the, uh, you know, the, the Marcellus Shale and all of that, just the things that, that I know, the little bit that I know of Mark is just fascinating and, and amazing and wonderful for what he's done with this, with this area. Well, I know that Mark really probably doesn't want to talk about himself <laughs> today. So we, we're going to be pushing and prodding him because we want to talk about all of the things that make him qualified to be the president of Lackawanna College. And also, he will tell us later on what is happening at the college, along with what will be happening in the future. So let's begin with finding out who Mark Volk is. And I, as I said earlier, I know you really didn't want to talk about yourself, but my thoughts and feelings are, I'm sure... Most of the people have no idea what makes you worthy to be the president of the college and also for everyone to know how fortunate we are to have you back in Scranton. And you obviously are happy to be back because you you have been all over the world and I'm just fascinated to hear your story. So let's begin with, should we go back as far as Easton? Well, we can do that. Let's start there. Sure. Thanks for having me on this afternoon. It, Thank you for it's coming. It's great. Yes. Uh, it's it's not easy to talk about myself, so you will have to probably drag some of this stuff out of me a little bit. Because uh, really it is, I, I think if you kind of look through my experiences, what I've really kind of focused on is the team building, being part of a team uh, that, that was instilled to me uh, early on. Uh, but certainly that I think that's really what's the strength of our organization at the college right now. It's the strength of the team. But but so sure we can we can kick back and talk about me and where I came from. I am originally from Easton, uh, born and raised down there. Uh, my father was uh, uh, an electrical engineer. Uh, spent a lot of time teaching at Lafayette College, uh, and so that really kind of formed the basis of a little bit of educational background that I had. Uh, you know, a little bit of higher ed as I watched him as a professor and things that he did and got exposure to Lafayette. And then uh, as I grew, uh, found that. I wanted to escape the Easton area, uh, get away from the area, although uh, my parents probably would have been thrilled had I stayed at Lafayette and taken a scholarship or the the uh, tuition remission that they would have offered. Oh, <laughs> I opted bet. to come to the University of Scranton instead, uh, <laughs> following uh, really on the on the heartstrings of a girlfriend at the time whose brother and whose girl his uh, her brother's girlfriend were here at uh, Scranton. And that led me up here. Uh, and then, of course, that relationship dissolved almost immediately as I left <laughs> as I left uh, East and, and came here and, and set me on a much greater path uh, uh, where I ultimately met my wife here. And when we were talking earlier, we talked about your father. Was he in the service, too? And that... That's what prompted you to sure. My go? dad uh, had, was that uh, end of the World War II generation. Uh, he uh, entered, entered the Marine Corps in the summer of 1944. If I remember right, 44. Um, no, I'm sorry. He was uh, 45, and so at that point, um, uh, they had pretty much stopped uh, sending units uh, towards the end of July. Uh, a lot of units were not being sent out. So he was in the re uh, Marine Reserve at the time, uh, stayed in for uh, years, and ultimately was activated for the Korean conflict uh, and was sent to Korea. Uh, that was the time my sister was born, and I was born a few years later in, uh, in 55. And so, but he always instilled in me kind of that sense of service. I, you know, I, I talked to him about his experiences. Obviously, he was very proud of that and remained in the reserves for a number of years uh, after he had gotten 
back from Korea. Uh, and so, yeah, that, uh, that became kind of a guide point for me in terms of service. And not just military service, but service to community, uh, service to nation. And so I, I always had, I think, that kind of inkling that I did want to, at some point, go into the military. You said that you started working as early as 16. Sure. And what did you do that at that point? Right. But um, at that point, I was trying to uh, pay for my first car. Uh, you know, my parents, <laughs> like had, you know, I, <laughs> I got my driver's thing. license on my 16th birthday, something that you could do back then. Uh, and uh, and I needed, uh, I wanted to get a car and my parents were pretty much adamant that if I wanted the car, I needed to be able to pay for it. Um, they did, in fact, advance me some money to buy the car, but I had to pay it off. And so I worked at that point. My dad had moved. Um, he was he was teaching part time uh, still at that point, but had gone to a local company and where he was uh, working as an electrical engineer. Uh, and they created uh, power panels that would go into anything to at that point. Uh, uh, I think they were doing some of the work with early Mercury space capsules, some of the power supplies, and then a lot of military contracts and that. Uh, and they needed uh, someone to help coat, anodize the aluminum extrusions that they used to attach their power supplies to. And so um, I ran those uh, that vat of acid and application of whatever else we were putting on there at the time. So that was my first job. Um, after a period of time, I ended up leaving there and, and went to work for a gas station. So I pumped gas um, in the mornings. I'd get up early before I went to school and then I'd come back after school, do my homework and sit there uh, and close the place up uh, until uh, I'd have to come in the next day. But that was during the 71, 72 time frame. So uh, 73, I was there for the, the uh, initial gas embargo the oil embargoes uh, the old odd even pumping gas times where uh, I, yeah. where either you were somebody's friend or you were somebody's enemy because you wouldn't give them gas at the time i remember those gas lines tom you're too young to remember that yeah right? I, yeah I most definitely mm-hmm. the great thing for me was that even born yet <laughs> i was there when i closed the, sh- the uh, gas station up at night so odd and even really didn't apply <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> i'm sure that growing up for you wasn't always so easy either because i i do see in your life experiences where you did also write down that your father was an alcoholic right like mine was like many of us that are in people that are listening right yeah i think we all have challenges uh, in our families you know very few people come up where they don't have something uh, in their life that causes a challenge for them Uh, for my dad he fought alcoholism for many many years never really accepted the fact that he did have a problem um and ultimately is it's what killed him uh he'd go for periods of time where he would just stop not drink at all and then come back to it eight years later uh, and so, yeah, it struggled. It, it, uh, it ended up, you know, being the cause of my parents divorcing. Um, it, you know, we had strained times, uh, especially as I kind of hit those puberty years where I wanted to rebel a little bit. He wasn't always, you know, very uh, easy to talk to or, or very understanding about where I was at the time. So it caused some problems for us. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, you can take those to be challenges. You can uh, take those experiences to help. Uh, learn and grow, uh, or you can let them get the best of you. Uh, and so for me, I guess maybe I, you know, it was that pig headed nature and I, I just wasn't going to let it shape me. Uh, and, and so that it gave me the incentive to continue on and, and to fight and to, you know, make something of myself and, you know, in some cases to make my dad proud, uh, ultimately of what I did, uh, irrespective of the struggles that he had at the time. And it certainly was a struggle. He seemed like he was really a strong person. And and that's what's hard to understand sometimes. Right. That if if they are so strong, you know, and I can associate with that because even with my own father, you would think that they could do something about that. And so in our show, even make a change. It's not always so easy to make a change. You can right. have most of your life together and it can be just that one little thing. That's right. That yeah. you just can't seem to. 
yes. make a change. That's right. Uh, you know, it's it's a struggle, and and uh, and it is a disease. And and uh, if unless you're able to overcome it, if accept it, accept the treatment, uh, and even then, it it certainly is not easy. It's it's an everyday process, uh, and you know we see that today in our society in many different respects. Whether it's it's drug addiction and people who you would never expect. Um, who get led down a path for whatever reason. Uh, and once they're down in that hole, it's very hard to climb back out. It's very difficult. Uh, and, and I think sometimes we tend to, to polarize uh, parts of our society as saying, oh, only these people have problems, whether it's with alcohol or drugs or, or whatever. It certainly isn't. Uh, it, it is everyday people. It is middle class. It is upper class. It's it's people whom you might never ex- suspect who have a problem and, and, and struggle just as anyone else does to overcome it. Yeah, it goes from the park bench to Park Avenue. You betcha. Does, does, you not, betcha. does not care who it affects. No, you betcha. Yeah. 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 You know, Mark, when I met you, and I heard a little bit about your background. You might think this is kind of funny, but knowing that you were in the service for 26 years, I look back at even shows that I watched about anyone that was in the Army or right. Navy or anything at all like that, and I felt intimidated. Maybe it was because of the shows like Hogan's Heroes or, <laughs> you know, or something like that. But when I talk to you and when I see you, you're so calm and so cool and collected over everything. And I would love you to just tell us because there's uh, about your 26 years in right. the service and then we'll get to the college later. But sure. can we talk about that? Sure. I, I, you know, I think there is certainly a, a stereotype uh, of the military professional, uh, certainly the military officers. Uh, that that came out of many different things. You know, you, you have some very strong and impassioned military leaders that you remember over time, whether it's Patton or or someone's portrayal of that, you know, John Wayne and the Green Berets or uh, or combat or Hogan's Heroes. You know, for me, it was combat. Uh, you had uh, you had the sergeant and you had the officer. And I always kind of aligned myself for whatever reason. I, I was towards the officer, um, Lieutenant Hanley. Uh, and 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 he was very much, I think, a, a more calm, probably indicative of of what you see in many military officers today. Um, th- you certainly have those who are more flamboyant or are, who are more authoritative, but you find that in any any leadership style out there. You know, there's a wide range of styles uh, f- from which people lead. Uh, lead. I think the vast majority of successful officers, though, tend to be not uh, towards that authoritative side because that only lasts for a period of time. You can only intimidate people for so long, uh, and then they either just walk away from you or they rebel. Uh, and so, you know, I, I learned a different style uh, as I came through the Army, uh, um, and that really shaped my leadership. Uh, you know, the Army invests, as do the other services, a lot uh, in leadership development. Um, and, and so through that time, I, I learned to be more collaborative. Um, certainly to try and hold my emotions in check because that's you make better decisions uh, from that perspective when you can remain calm. Um, sometimes calm is just a facade uh, as well because people um, will also take on the emotions that you evoke. Uh, so if you're appear to be scared if you I don't know there, there's an old thing back to the days of the horse cavalry you know where they used to say steady in the saddle and and that really was true because your horse could sense if you're on this horse and your knees are shaken the horse can sense that fear and, and they'll exhibit that same trait well the unit is the same way when you're dealing with people when you're trying to lead them they can tell they sense whether you're being sincere or not uh, although I think it was uh, Groucho Marx who made the comment about, you know, one of the greatest qualities an individual can have is sincerity. And once you learn to fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> so, you know, it, it really, there is something to that. You have to be able to appear calm even when you're not, uh, but certainly to, to keep those emotions in check. And so that for me has been something that I've tried to do and model, not always successful, uh, but but mostly that is, I, I think, you know, really a great way to approach your leadership. Um, so, you know, I, I've had very typically uh, a career that you'll see among many military officers. Um, I've done a few things that are 
I won't call unique, but maybe are slightly different uh, than the mainstream uh, because I spent some time in a part of the world that many officers did not or in a program that they didn't. So, you know, I went in uh, under as a field artillery officer, a combat arms officer, uh, spent about 13 years there learning my craft and trade as a leader. And uh, and then during that time, also trained uh, to be a Middle East, North Africa specialist, where the army invested about two and a half years of time for me to learn Arabic uh, and to do so about a year and a half of immersion in North Africa and throughout the Middle East. And then ultimately, I transitioned over to intelligence. I just kind of led me that way and spent my last 13 years uh, in intelligence and, and, you know, had a very typical assignment pattern there as well, uh, in and out of units and um, in command, out of command, uh, into staff positions and, you know, back and forth and overseas. So we spent uh, six years, two different tours in Germany and a year and a half in North Africa, uh, in Tunisia. Um, And then the rest of the time bouncing around the United States, various places from, you know, the Pentagon to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, to... uh, Tell us some Four of the terrible stories. Years in yeah, tell us some of them. Well, let's, let's hold up. I, want, I do. I want to hear the stories too. But we have to. We do have to take a quick break here. Okay. So you're listening to Make a Change with your host Terry Martin. I'm Tom Jenkins, and our special guest today is Mark Folk, president of Lackawanna College. And uh, we're going to hear some fascinating travel stories when we come back on 94.3 FM, The Talker. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. I mean, think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get that confidence you need with Madari Clinicals. They are a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti-aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madari Clinicals gives you that confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madari Clinicals. Check out MadariClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I Clinicals.com or call 866-646-3374. Take on the world with Madari Clinicals. And we're back on Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I'm Tom Jenkins, along with your host, Terry Martin. And our special guest today in studio is Mark Volk, president of Lackawanna College. And uh, not to really get into any war stories, if you will, but uh, you spent a lot of time in the military army, you said it was? Correct. And uh, traveled all over the place with numerous positions that you were talking about. Right. What were some of those positions and why did you have to, you know, why, why were you put into those positions? Sure, right. You know, again, as I, I had mentioned, uh, I had a pretty typical career pattern uh, for a military officer, an army officer. And so generally you start in a position of, uh, of something what many people might equate to or understand as a platoon leader, uh, you know, the probably the lowest level of of command i'll say command although the army doesn't consider a command position but an authoritative position where you're in charge of a group uh, of soldiers and and have a specific mission to carry out and so that's very typical of uh, at the lieutenant level uh, and and if you're smart uh, you learn that you don't know it all and that uh, your non-commissioned officers uh, and your soldiers really are the experts. Uh, as an officer, you really are a generalist. You have some specific skills and knowledge, but you're not the expert in every piece of it. So what you really have to do is learn how do you train and manage that team of experts in a way that you can accomplish the mission. So, you know, mission, vision, values, resources, I think applies at any level of leadership that you want to talk about. And and so as an army officer, as a junior officer, that's where you begin to hone that craft. Uh, and then, you know, you move up in the ranks and uh, at the rank of captain, uh, typically somewhere around the, your fifth or seventh year of service, you would look at entering into a company level command, company or battery. And at that, you know, you're talking at that point somewhere around 100 to 150 or so soldiers uh, for whom you are responsible and again uh, required to carry out a mission uh, and it, and then uh, you know you as you take on more and more of those positions the units get larger then that 
your ability to control individual actions becomes less and less. So you really have to understand how a chain of command works. You have to learn you know, how you train diverse and dis- different units uh, and how you ensure that ultimately they are all working from the same vision uh, of a mission and understanding the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Mark, I, I just have a question. When you went into the Army, sure. did you intend to have a, to make this be your career, or did you just grow into it as you kept going through those right. five, seven years? Right, and not a bit. I never and... expected it to be a career. <laughs> um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, although I did, I mentioned, you know, the idea that my dad had kind of instilled in me this sense of service, and I had this thought in my life that I really, that I ultimately would like to be a, a military officer. <laughs> what drove me uh, initially into Army ROTC at the University of Scranton was the fact that, you know, I was married uh, at age 19. My son was born at age 20. And I needed to find something uh, where I could, uh, you know, take care of my family. And, you know, I had kind of entered college thinking that I was I w- was going to go through a pre-law program and I wanted to be an attorney. And the reality of life was that financially that wasn't going to happen for me. Uh, and I had responsibilities. And so the Army became a way for me to do that. And, you know, so I went in having a commitment of about three years. I thought, I don't know, three, five um, Five became 10, uh, very typical to a pattern of military officers. I almost got out at about the 10th year, uh, started thinking about it. I was actually uh, back at Lafayette College teaching in the ROTC de- department at that point. Uh, and, you know, you, you kind of ebb and flow. And, and, and I, I, I did have this thought that I was going to get out and talked with my wife. And Lynn was ready for me to get out and... Lynn hates this story, so hopefully she won't be listening when I tell this, but, but I did go through a point where I was going to get out, and I went and I, I interviewed with a headhunter company down in Philadelphia who specialized in, in junior military officer placement, and, uh, and I was about ready to go out and buy my suit because they had set up my first uh, interview, which was really kind of a practice interview. I was going to interview for a production manager position at Frito-Lay. And and I literally woke up. That's a big up, switch. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, though again, leadership, leadership management, uh, not dissimilar. Uh, I woke up in a cold sweat, kind of sat bolt upright about a week before the interview, <laughs> having had a dream where I was unable to keep up with bag production to fit the number of chips on the line. Very similar, if you remember the old Lucille the, ball. Did you watch I Love Lucy um, before you right. went to the bed old that Lucille night? ball, yeah, of, of the bonbons uh-huh. and the boxes. Yeah, I mean, almost the same thing, but with Fritos. And <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, I had just come out of, I had come out of battery command, that, that captain's level of command. Uh, I was in command of a, uh, of a nuclear-capable missile unit. Uh, you know, I literally <laughs> would, would make life and death decisions, and now I'm worried about Frito-Lay production. <laughs> and that's, that's probably not a good way to put it because those jobs are very important and critical. In fact, I have a friend who, who is a manager uh, of a factory uh, that, that does exactly that. Uh, but for me, it, I, I realized that that wasn't the path for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I really did, although I struggled a little bit with some of the things, that, you know, some of the experiences, because not every day is good, whether you're in the military or in any job, and not every month is good, or sometimes not every right. year is good. Uh, and so I had struggled a little bit coming out of a unit, and I was a little frustrated with what I was doing, but I really did love um, the military, and I loved being an officer and having that opportunity to lead. And so that kind of led me right back into it and said, I'm not getting out. I'm not going to stop at that point. And and uh, and at that point, if you if you go past ten, um, twenty should be your goal at least because that's where you hit your retirement. Uh, and so once you make that commitment, uh, I think it is important because you you know you kind of reach that point where you're very you're very marketable as a junior officer. In those interim periods, you're maybe less marketable um, as a retiree. You know, then, you know, you've gotten to that rank structure where people are now, again, willing to listen to you a little bit Mm -hmm. and maybe invest uh, in in your skills in different ways. So so for me, I set that 20 years, 20 stretch to 26. uh, And and here I am. And what did you what was your end? uh, My rank. I was a full colonel. Yeah, I retired as a uh, a, a colonel. Yeah, we appreciate that. Thanks. It was my pleasure to serve. Mm. 
So, Mark, you did a lot of leading, if you will, uh, in a lot of authoritative positions in the military. Where did you go from the military and how did you get, obviously, into a leadership position right after that using the military? Sure. Um, well, you know, as as I continued on in my career, I uh, had a lot of different opportunities. You know, I kind of transitioned out of, of artillery and had that interim phase where I had learned Arabic. Uh, and Why that, did you learn Arabic? Why did you have to was, learn Arabic? The Army, the Army has a program. The other services do as well. The Army is probably the most established. In fact, ultimately, I ended up managing the program for the Army in my last assignment. They, it's a program called the Foreign Area Officer Program. And what they really do is they train officers to become regional specialists and to serve as either defense attaches in embassies, where you're in charge of, of really you're, a, you're an overt collector of intelligence mm-hmm. uh, on the military of that, or, of that country. Um, or to be a security assistance officer or a military advisor, uh, someone who has an understanding of the not just the language, but the culture and the history of a region of the world and serve on a staff uh, to help provide the commanders uh, with that background as they make their decisions to understand what are the real implications of those decisions. And so I trained as a Middle East, North Africa specialist, uh, and part of that included language training and then a period of immersion where they would send you in region and you would have to travel around and and live uh, and function within that. And so I spent a year in, in, in a very hardship place Monterey, California, the Presidio of Monterey, where I had to learn. I spent a year in the Defense Language Institute uh, learning Arabic. And then from there, I went to the Department of State's Advanced Arabic School, which was then in Tunisia, had been moved from Lebanon uh, after the problems in Lebanon, moved to Tunis. Did and you, so I, excuse me, sure. did your family get to go with you? Yep, always? they did. Yeah, yeah, which was a tremendous opportunity. My son now will say that was probably his best assignment ever. Uh, he was... Um, in a small cooperative school uh, that had uh, in his class, I think there were 11 students or somewhere around there and, and less than half of the students in the school were American. So there were students from every part of the world uh, in that school. And so, yeah, great opportunity. Uh, and then I got, I got the opportunity, not just to go to language school again, to, to continue to hone my language skills, but I traveled uh, literally across North Africa and into the Middle East, very few countries that I did not get to visit during that time. Um, and, and so f- then from there, you know, again, it, it, it becomes a man, it's a leadership development process for the army. Um, I moved into the intelligence arena, I became uh, the senior intelligence officer for a third infantry division, which at that point was in Würzburg, Germany, you know, about a 15,000 soldier strong uh, combat division. Uh, after a year doing that, I took command of a battalion, uh, which um, is at the lieutenant colonel rank uh, for an army officer. It's a very selective process. Um, you don't, there aren't a ton of opportunities for that. Uh, I was very fortunate to get selected, and that's a two-year command process. You spend a total of two years, um, plus or minus one day mm-hmm. uh, is is the tour length and to step outside of that one day you must have a four star general approve uh, that you're going to either leave early or uh, stay an extra time that's how few opportunities there are and so they want to make sure that people do get that chance uh, and so uh, it was then that uh, I commanded what was the 103rd military intelligence battalion ultimately became the 101st uh, as we as the army moved its flag structure around. So the division that I had been in became the first infantry division instead of the third. Uh, and then got the opportunity to deploy that battalion to Bosnia uh, in, uh, in September of 96 as, uh, as part of the end of uh, the implementation force that was implementing uh, the uh, Dayton Accords uh, that had uh, you know, stopped the, uh, the conflict in Bosnia at the time. Uh, and into the stabilization force, force which uh, continued to implement those. Uh, and then back out, you know, um, into the Pentagon uh, for about a year and a half into the National War College, which is that kind of senior level of educational experience for the Army, and then uh, back into the Pentagon for my last four years uh, until I retired, where I was uh, the division chief in the Army Strategy and Plans uh, division and had oversight of that same foreign area officer program, as well as a couple other things in, in, uh, in doing the policy and, and uh, funding uh, for that program. 
And now you're very young, retiree, which right. you're not retired because then how did you end up where I am, where you are right now? Well, I, I think there's a very important lesson uh, to be learned. We, we talk a lot about um, remaining in contact with people whom you've met over the time in networking, uh, in, in mentoring. Uh, and so I was very fortunate uh, when I was sitting on the steps of the University of Scranton's uh, Student Union uh, back in 1976. Um, I happened to run into then Army Captain Raymond Angeli, uh, who convinced me to join Army ROTC. And Ray was a mentor to me throughout my Army career. Uh, he was, um, had similar paths. He was also a foreign area officer. Um, uh, he, so he kind of helped me along that perspective. He worked in the same office that I ended up working in and then running. Uh, and, and so, uh, Ray had become president of Lackawanna college, uh, back in 94. Um, we had had some, uh, some collaboration back and forth when I was teaching in the ROTC department at uh, Lafayette college in the mid eighties. He was at the university of Scranton as the professor of military science had come back again. So we had kept in touch about five years before I got ready to retire. Uh, he had taken Lackawanna college from near bankruptcy and almost being academically uh, unaccredited uh, to being strong uh, and growing at that point. And so he reached out to me and said, I know you're coming back. Uh, how'd you like to come back and help me uh, to grow this organization? I need some depth, you know, and again, a very familiar role. He was the commander. I was the executive officer. Uh, and, you know, so I, I worked the daily operations, the, you know, making sure people were doing what they needed to do. Uh, and he got to lead the organization, uh, become the face of the organization and fund the organization. And that's what, it, that's what we were able to do. So when I retired at the end of 2003, we moved back. Uh, Lynn and I knew we were coming back here. And so Ray uh, had then created a position to bring me into the college uh, to help him start to grow. Never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that eight years later, <laughs> I'd find myself sitting as the president of the college. Not, it was the farthest thing from my thoughts. Um, I, I just thought it was a great opportunity to come back into the community and, and help him. Uh, and I could see his passion for the mission. I didn't know much about Lackawanna College at the time. To me, it was that college across the street from the University of Scranton that I really didn't know much about. Um, and, and so uh, I came in thinking, this is a great chance to transition into a job and learn something different uh, and help him as, as he had helped me. Wow, what, what an opportunity it turned out to be. Well, I want to I d- dive in a little bit more in those eight years that you were there sure. on exactly how and what and everything, but we got to take a quick break. Okay. So when we come back, we'll talk about that. This is Make a Change with your host, Terry Martin. I'm Tom Jenkins, and our special guest in studio today, Mark Volk, president of Lackawanna College, and you're listening to 94.3 FM The Talker. We'll be right back. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. I mean, think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get that confidence you need with Madari Clinicals. They are a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti-aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Medary Clinicals gives you that confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Medary Clinicals. Check out MedaryClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I Clinicals.com or call 866-646-3374. Take on the world with Medary Clinicals. Welcome back to Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker, with your host, Terry Martin. I'm Tom Jenkins, and in the studio today, special guest, Mark Full, president of Lackawanna College, and we do this every time with every talk show that, that I work. We start talking during the break, and it's like, no, we got to get that on. We got to put that on. You had said something uh, when you were talking about you know, the networking and then uh, how you met up with the same gentleman from sure. when you were beginning in college to you know eight years 
you know, just coming right out. But you said something during the break that I found fascinating. You said timing is everything. You have to put yourself in positions that you can take advantage of. Right. right. Can you s- explain that a little bit more in, in depth? How do you do that? Sure. Um, yeah, it, it was actually it, it's something that I talked uh, with with my staff now about uh, my leaders as well as when I was an officer uh, and, and I had junior officers for me. I, I, we make lots of decisions uh, in our careers and, and there are opportunities for us along the way to do things, whether it's go to a school uh, or get some additional education uh, or go out and meet someone or learn something different. And so what I would always encourage and, and still do encourage people to do is find those things that help to make them more marketable, to make them more unique, um, and not necessarily to make decisions that will cut paths or opportunities for them open later. Certainly there are times when you must burn a bridge behind you, right. but you need to be cautious about those. Mm-hmm. You do it for the right reason and understand when it's gone, it's gone. You can't go back that way. Uh, but, but put yourself in a position where when it becomes time that someone is going to do something that's going to impact you long term, th- that you have some say in it, or you have at least positioned yourself where you've made that opportunity open for you. So, you know, it really is about whether it's schooling or meeting someone, talking to someone. Timing is everything. Certain jobs just come open at a certain time or certain opportunities happen. If you're positioned, that you can take advantage of it, then you're in great shape. And have you done that in the, when you first got back to, to Lackawanna College? Well, you know, I, I, I think Ray helped me to do that. Um, and certainly I did, uh, you know, I went back and I started working on a PhD. Um, and, and I, you know, went to law conferences, things that, that would help me were just talking with people who did have the knowledge and experience because now I'm in a, I'm in a wholly different realm. I'm in higher education. Uh, you know, although I did have some experience, you know, I did teach uh, at one of the army schools and I did have oversight of implementing educational objectives in my last job as well, but I didn't have that in-depth knowledge. But the reality is that as a leader, there are many times you're not the expert. You have people who are. So that comes back to the ability to build a team uh, and, and to create the vision, the mission, the values, and resource that team uh, and move it all in one direction. I, I had a, you know, I, because of my career change from artillery to intelligence, I moved very late in my career. For most people, if you do that, it's a career ender. You're probably not going to go very far. Um, and for whatever reason, I, I survived it. You know, sometimes you make stupid decisions and and you get saved anyhow. <laughs> but so I found myself, I talked about being the senior intelligence officer uh, for 3rd Infantry Division. I had been an intelligence officer at that point for three years. I, I knew very little about the specifics of that career field. And I went to work for a two-star general who, who commanded that division, uh, Mechanized Infantry Division. And, and he expected me to know my craft, to know my job. And I was, you know, I, I thought this was the end for me. And he sat down and, and in like the first three minutes put me totally at ease. He said, look, I don't expect you to know everything, to be perfect. You know, if you're right 50% of the time at what you tell me you think the enemy is going to do, then you're doing really great. You're probably better than most people I've talked to. So what I need you to do is create a rational vision of what can happen. I will then ensure that the division, the Army division, has a vision of that, and we're all moving in the same direction. If we're doing that, I don't care what happens. I can adjust. If we're in different directions, I can't. But if we're all focused in the same direction, we can adjust to anything. And and that, to me, was just kind of a, a, a moment of clarity that I realized, wow, that's it. That is the answer for any organization you think of in terms of yourself as a leader. It's being able to establish that vision of where you're going, where you see the organization going, and having everyone aligned behind that. And things change. You know, the, the old army mantra was, you know, 
no plan survives first contact with the enemy. You know, you put this big plan together, and as soon as you start, something happens that's going to change it. Because in reality, the enemy has their own plan, mm-hmm. and it's not for you to win. So, <laughs> you know, so, so things are going to change. And again, the, much of what I learned as an army officer, as a leader, applies directly in any organization you want to talk to. You have to learn some specifics. I had to learn about higher ed, and I had to learn how things work. But I don't have to be the expert. I can't be. And so what I've tried to do, not again, not knowing that I was going to become president of college, never thinking I would, but I began to build a team, help Ray to build a team that I thought would take us uh, where we needed to go as an institution. Uh, and how we could grow and develop into an institution that that really did service the needs of our community, uh, of our local students specifically, and help them uh, to to grow academically and to find family sustainable wage positions, and and that's just basic leadership. It really is. Whether you're an army officer or you're head of GM or any other organization in between, it's about understanding about visioning it's about team building it's about leading it's about resourcing and getting everybody on that team uh, in that one direction that, that one having direction. that common vision that one direction and if something by any chance does get in the way right. you can adapt as Oper- long as everybody's yeah. still on that same that's right things direction. will happen and again you know it, it's funny because i I used to, although my my staff sometimes would hate this i talk to them about <laughs> you know I'll, I'll throw a lot of military acronyms on them and i still do i mean at 26 years you can't you can't mm-hmm. overcome it but but w- we talked in planning one of my my first job as an intelligence officer was as a, a planner uh for a, a light infantry division for an army light infantry division and so it was our job to kind of think about what are the what ifs you know mm-hmm. here's our plan and so what we did was we created branches and sequels branches are what happens if your plan works well You know, what if it works really well and you're like so far ahead that now what do you do next? And the sequel, those are, I'm sorry, those are sequels. So those are sequels. Those are the the what next. Mm -hmm. And then the branches are what happens if things don't go so well. And how do you adjust to those things that you didn't expect? Well, again, when you're in business, some things you do something and sometimes it goes so well, you, you know, you just have to, what's the next? Mm-hmm. So those, those are those sequels that you should be thinking about. And the branches are what happens if you hit a wall? What happens if something doesn't work? How do you overcome that? It's not just, well, I quit, I stop. You know, in the army, it was life or death. Right. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's not life or death, but it's, you know, it's metaphorically life or death. It could be for your company. Uh, and that could have tremendous economic uh, issues, you know. So, so it really is similar in many respects. Uh, it, you know, kind of to me, leadership is leadership. And so, if you understand how to apply the principles, you learn how to build a team, how to vision, uh, how to f- how to make sure that your unit is as best trained, equipped, resourced as it can be, and it has a common goal and vision. Then you, you know you have a you're not guaranteed of success, but you certainly right. have and, a great and nothing, chance. And, and nothing really just fell in your lap. No, I, as I'm listening to you and I I read everything about you. There's a long list of work that you did. You had to work hard at every step that right. brought you to where you are today. So many times I think even our young people think <laughs> they want to start at the top. They're really that's impossible. That's right. Right. You really do have to learn, uh, you know, you say from the ground up, but very close to that, uh, because to you have to understand the organization at its basic roots. Um, you know, so, OK, I was a student in college, so, you know, I understood it from that perspective. Uh, and so we all bring that to the classroom. Uh, but I also spent some time, uh, you know, teaching. And so I understood what it was like to grade papers and, you know, try to work develop a course curriculum um, and and some of the challenges uh, that you have in a classroom. Um, and, you know, the, so, yeah, I, I had a lot of a lot of what I did in the past built me to really to where I am now. Uh, and I and I struggled for some, you know, and I didn't always make the best decisions. You know, I I had mistakes along the way. Uh, I had failures. Um, again, I think there's a perception sometimes that the military is very much a, a zero tolerance organization nothing is farther from the truth uh, you know you certainly 
Uh, when you get into a point where you have people's lives on the line, you don't want, you can't make bad decisions. At that point, your decisions should be good. But as you're building, as you're training your way up to that, um, people make mistakes all the time. You learn and grow from those, hopefully. Um, I try and make those teaching moments uh, f- within the college as well. We still have them. I still have them. I don't always make the right decision. Um, I always try and make the best decision. Uh, and what I tell my staff is that, you know, I, I have for me, there is one line in the sand that if you cross that line, there's no coming back. And for me, that's integrity. Mm-hmm. You know, if if you lie to me, that we're not in combat. People's lives aren't on the line. If you lie to me, how do I regain that trust? Because that tells me typically if you're lying, it's based out of a self-centered protectionist thing. You did something wrong. You're trying to protect yourself uh, from that as opposed to owning up to it, taking responsibility for it and, and moving then learning forward. F- and learning from it. Exactly right. And so that's that's what I tell my staff. I don't, you know, we can do lots of things. You know, certainly I don't ever do anything that's going to get someone killed or, you know, but at the same time, we make decisions all the time and, and we don't always make the best. We should make the best decision for the best reasons. Uh, and I think one of the things that, that we've looked at from the college in terms of that visioning, that strategy of where we're going, a few years back, we kind of stepped and back and said, who are we as a college? Um, who should we be? Uh, and, and what we did say was, look, there's, when we make any decision for the college, it should be rooted we should be able to answer two things. Um, is this in the best interest of the institution? And more importantly, it is, is it in the best interest of our students? If the answer is yes to both of those, then whatever it is that we want to do, then that's based in, in good founding ideas, and we ought to move ahead with that. Sometimes it's not the best. Sometimes what we put in place isn't the best way to do it. Uh, and so we learn that, you know, oops, <laughs> should have done something a little different. But again, those are learning moments uh, for us. And, and I think we're stronger because we, we do take the time to look at those. Well, we definitely want to make hear, changes. want to de- hear more about Lackawanna College now, uh, that vision that you brought to it uh, when you first got there and, and where you've come today. Right. We do have to take one more quick break. And you are listening to Make a Change with your host, Terry Martin. I'm Tom Jenkins. Our special guest today, Mark Volk, president of Lackawanna College. And uh, I'm loving how this is all coming together right at the end. And I can't wait to hear where it's at today. And we will be right back on 94.3 FM, The Talker. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. I mean, think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get that confidence you need with Madari Clinicals. They are a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madari Clinicals gives you that confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madari Clinicals. Check out MadariClinicals.com. That's M E D E R I Clinicals.com or call 866 646 3374. Take on the world with Madari Clinicals. We're back on Make a Change on 94.3 FM. The Talker with our special guest in studio today, President of Lackawanna College, Mark Volk. And uh, we're, we've been talking about, you know, more or less how Mark has learned everything that he's learned up to this point. And uh, I'm just going to ask this straight out question. How did you become president of Lackawanna College yeah, how did within that eight years? <laughs> and that's not a shot. I mean, I'm seriously asking. Uh, seriously. How did you become president, a lot of, Mark? <laughs> a lot of people ask that question. And, uh, my family will look at that, too. And, and, you know, uh, I, I was, it's funny. I, I actually had a chance recently to go down and testify in front of Congress. And, and I woke up one morning and I had just gotten the information. It was in an email I, I, that someone had sent me uh, providing me the opportunity. And I was laying in bed having a cup of coffee with my wife as we normally do in the morning to start the day and I said hey I, I, I'm gonna go have this chance to testify and she looked at me and she said who are you mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah so there's a lot of that shock uh, for me you know again I hadn't kind of thought about it but but Ray uh, has was getting to that point where he was ready to retire thinking it was time for him uh, to to move uh, and he, we had talked about it, and there was a little some earlier discussion about you know 
handing it off to me. Um, and, and the board, though rightly so, said, you know, that's, that's not our best way ahead. Whether Mark is the right person or not, um, whether we think that we need to do a search. Um, and so they opted to do a national search, uh, brought a company in to do that for them. And, and I became just another candidate. Uh, with that. And so I fought my way through the first round and got mm-hmm. into the finals and, uh, and then sat through interviews um, and, uh, and was among the top two and ultimately became the top pick. Um, certainly, you know, I, I was a known quantity uh, to many members of our board, but I, you know, wasn't necessarily a unanimous pick um, by everyone on that board. But but I did uh, have the opportunity. And, and so that's ultimately how I became president um, and and was notified by the board. Uh, and then um, the announcement was made at a, uh, at a college community meeting to our staff and faculty. And to my utter surprise, there was a standing ovation. And that, you know, was kind of a, an understanding for me that I could be accepted, that, that I was part of that process, uh, and that that gave me the ability to help grow and guide us uh, in the direction I think we all wanted to go. Uh, and so I wasn't coming in from the outside. There were, you know, it was, I, I knew the people in the organization and the community. And that certainly, I think, helped. And that direction that you wanted to, to go with with your now sure. new team, right? How did you get there? Yeah. Um, well, we're still th- we're still going. Um, nice. At at this point, the I think for me, when I came in and looked at the college, you know, I remember uh, what we would refer to uh, affectionately as lack of knowledge junior college. No, that wasn't just you. Yeah, I know. That was all yeah, of us. That in was Scranton. the community mantra. Yeah, yeah no kidding. Yeah. And it's still out there. Um, you know, there was, it's the 13th grade. It's many different pejoratives that you can have about what really is a community college mission. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is, it is end to end upper level programs as well as programs, uh, developmental programs where you have students who come out of high school. They're not quite college ready. Um, the light comes on for us at different times educationally. Sometimes it never comes on for people and the higher ed is not for them. Uh, for many of them, it is later. Uh, my wife was one of those. Lynn went to Keystone for a year, you know, kind of squeaked by with a 2.0, uh, got out. We got married. Uh, we had our son. I went in the army. Eight years later, she went back to college. Mm-hmm. Uh, 3.96 mm-hmm. or, you know, 3.9 grade point average. Um, it, the light had come on. It meant something to her more at that point. Um, you know, she's now uh, the uh, CFO, Senior Vice President for Finance at WVIA. Um, she's just a tremendously talented individual. But at the time, back in the 70s, she wasn't ready for college. That happens all of the time, and that's our mission. Um, you know, we're a local college. We are still very much rooted in the initial beliefs of our founders, the Seeley family, who, who when they created Lackawanna Business College back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it became a school of, of opportunity for, at that point, primarily sons, uh, but certainly through the World War II uh, era, daughters as well of, of minors to get out of the mines and into the business end uh, of the op- of the industry, and so that really is the root of our college. It is a it's a college of opportunity, and so I, I as I kind of worked my way into the college, what I saw was almost we'd become maybe ashamed ourselves of who we were mm-hmm. and what we did, and and the reality is that without us, our community doesn't have a lot of opportunity. We're the college that educates the local young men and women to a large degree who stay here and enter into businesses and industries or who go to college to complete a four-year degree and then come back to our area. And so uh, for us, what I saw was we were very good at that developmental point where we could help young men and women who weren't quite ready to overcome those challenges uh, and then uh, to move them forward. And so th- we began looking at ourselves, uh, remissioning, revisioning ourselves. Uh, and th- it is really, it's not me, it's that team. Uh, it is that understanding of what our vision is, what our mission is to help the community, to help our students, young men and women. Certainly we have some students from outside the area, 
uh, who come in, but we're about 80% local. Uh, and that's led us down the path of programs like our petroleum and natural gas program or our vascular program, uh, where you have students come out with a two-year associate's degree making, you know, 50 degree or $50,000 uh, in the vascular side, 70, 80 in the PNG side. The opportunities are there. A school has to be here that is willing to look at the challenges. And certainly we do have tremendous challenges. You know, you look at our educational system, something's wrong. Um, I, I'm not the expert. I don't know that I know exactly what's wrong. I know that we've had success in dealing with the students who come to us and they do come with tremendous challenges, uh, not just some uh, many times educational challenges. Our, our students in many cases are socioeconomically challenged. They're coming out of poor families. Uh, many of them are first generation students. They don't understand how to study. Um, they have a range of issues that we see in high schools, whether it's you know ADD, ADHD, um, it is uh, behavioral problems. It is, you know, you, you, you run the gamut of those problems. And what we found is that what they need is they need someone to care. They need someone to be interested in not just what they do in the classroom, but how it, they get there and what happens after they go home and how can we help them to understand how to study. Uh, and and how to make good life choices, those types of things. And so we've invested a lot uh, heavily into that support structure side that helps them to overcome those many, many challenges just to get them to the point where they can start worrying about the fact that, you know what, I can learn math, mm -hmm. you know, or I can get through this program and get to college. So, so we've been very good at that. Uh, and as we look forward, uh, we see ourselves growing uh, in those opportunities. We're certainly looking out ahead at what's coming down the pike, uh, whether it's uh, in now following behind that, that inexpensive energy source the, of, of natural gas. Something's going to come in, whether it's, it's manufacturing again. We could, I think, with the right vision, become a manufacturing hub again if we take charge of our lives here in the community and put say, yourself we're in do the it. position to take advantage of it you bet it yeah. yeah we're in that the opportunity is there the timing is right but if we sit here it's going to go somewhere else right if we get out there and advocate for it, if we go out and find the companies if we talk to them if we find really it's finding an industry not just an individual company an industry, because you can make a company, you know, so I'll give you a tax incentive for 10 years. 10 years later, that company is looking for the next tax incentive. Mm -hmm. If you bring an industry in and it's integrated into their community, I and mean, we have a very strong blue uh, collar workforce here. You know, it's, it's, it's our region's heritage. Focus on it. Find those companies that need it. We can do the educational process at Lackawanna College. That's what we do. Uh, we're really good at it. Uh, whether it's job training or it's degree focused, we could do it all. And that's really how we visioned ourselves and where we're going as, an, as a college, keeping that local route, finding ways to ensure that we're helping the local community to grow and develop. That's who our students are. That's what our institution is about. Uh, and that's where we're going. I'm sitting here taking notes <laughs> for my own business, for my own life, because anything that you're saying, any of us can adapt our lives right. to. It really is rocket science, right? Yeah, I mean, if it was rocket science, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you know? that. <laughs> <laughs> well, for some, it might be. It definitely might be. Uh, I, I just, I love the fact that you don't just focus on the student's education itself. You focus on the student. Right. You know, and, and how you can help them in every aspect, which in turn. And our community. It, it's it helps amazing. the community. Yeah. yeah. What you can do here with some people who we've heard recently aren't. Oh, well, I heard on the news. So happy about our area. But I, I that's not what I'm hearing. No. From no. many people. That's right. that's false. The, yeah, it is. A, it's a tremendous area. And I think in many respects that we've we've kind of gotten focused looking backwards um, and you know and maybe some of the woe is me sometimes I, I I'll I, I've came up with this uh, idea that I sometimes throw out when I'm teaching folks or doing some leadership training I call it the Volk principle and it really is that some days you know it doesn't matter who you are who you know where you went to college how much money you have who your parents were what kind of car you drive it, none of that matters some days it just sucks to be you 
You know, some days you have a bad day or it's a mm-hmm. bad month or a bad year. You can either let that define you or you can let it be a challenge for you. And the uh, learning experience. That's right. And, and that's where I think we are. We're at that defining moment in our region. You know, we've looked backwards for so long. There are tremendous opportunities out there for us. We are, it's a wonderful area to live. Those of us that have built, gone away and come back, we've come back here for a reason. Mm-hmm. And it's not a negative reason. Right. You it's see because there are great opportunities. Yeah. And, and so we just have to take advantage of them. We have to start saying, look, you know, we, we've had some rough times here. Let's look forward. Let's figure out how to fix this. There are opportunities. Let's take advantage of them. President of Lackawanna College, Mark Volk, has been our special guest today with an awesome, awesome message on uh, how we can make changes within our own lives and, and how Mark and Lackawanna College are making changes as well. So thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Definitely thank appreciate you. it. This is Make a Change with your host, Terry Martin. I'm Tom Jenkins on 94.3 FM, The Talker. Have a great weekend.